Hello again, friends and fiends. Today I want to continue our epic quest into our Cinderi Girl's incendiary past incarnations. If you haven't seen the previous video, Disney and Perot vs. Grimm, I do recommend checking that one out as well, as there are some key details in that that also play into this tale I'm about to tell. That one's obviously grim and kinda gory, so be warned. In our video today, there's less gore and more bad ash. <laughs> get it? Because Cinderella? <sighs> anyway, get ready to get metal, because in addition to a horrid step family, we've got flaming skulls, an endearingly creepy alive doll, mysterious riders, and a trio of disembodied hands, too. So hop into your mortar and grab your pestle and let's fly into the thick of the dreaded woods to uncover Cinderella's creepier and fiery origins. But before we do, it's dangerous to go into the wild woods of the World Wide Web alone. Take this! Today's video is sponsored by NordVPN. Whether you browse the internet on your phone or computer, Nord has got your back with their Android and iOS apps and thousands of servers in over 60 countries. Feeling lost? No worries, Nord is extremely easy to use. Just install, select your preferred location. Look, you could literally be anywhere giving you access to all of that sweet, sweet region-blocked content. Wink. And voila, continue your internet adventure with confidence and in safety as Nord double encrypts your data for increased privacy. I mean, for the kinds of videos I make, I need to research some really weird and creepy things, and I don't want ads for those things following me around. Or, you know, to end up on some list. Yikes. Using a VPN can help with that. Start protecting your browsing on up to six devices today by going to nordvpn.com slash abitfrank and entering in code abitfrank to get a staggering 70% off of a three-year plan and an additional month for free which for safety, security, and the really cool ability to hop around the globe from your own machine and see what other regions see is an amazing deal. And it helps to support the channel as well. The world of the web is now your oyster. Thank you to NordVPN for sponsoring today's video. Okay, right, where were we? Best fairy tale ever. Right. Before the Grimm's, before Perot, before many other stories too, I'm sure there were other stories, and other stories, and other stories. This story of fiery death, the threat of being eaten, bravery, wit, otherworldly advice, typical evil stepfamily, and of course, my girl Baba Yaga has roots dating back at least to the old horse goddess cults, which predate classical Greek culture. And that's according to Dr. Piccola Estes, who literally wrote the book, well, several on this stuff. So versions and elements of this story have been around for a very long, long time. You will absolutely see hints and similarities between this tale and Cinderella, and as always, it's amazing to see what has changed, what was erased, and what was embellished through the centuries. Friends and fiends, let's settle in for the tale of Vasilisa the Brave, or Beautiful. Once there was, and once there was not, a young mother on her deathbed surrounded by her loving husband and her young daughter Vasilisa. All were praying for a peaceful transition into the afterlife for their beloved. Before passing, the mother does not leave a fancy dress, but instead gives the doll to her daughter, which is dressed nearly the same as her, and a mother's blessing. Should Vasilisa lose her way or be in need of help, she should ask the doll what to do and it will guide her. She is to feed it when it is hungry, keep it with her always, and never tell a soul about it. After her mother passes, the doll eases Vasilisa's pain and suffering, not only because it's a memento of her mother, but also because it, well, comes alive once fed. Yeah, not creepy at all saying comforting things like, don't fret, the morning is wiser than the evening. According to this tale, the father and Vasilisa mourn desperately for their lost love. The father is actually distraught, but does remarry, but more with his daughter's well-being in mind than anything else. He's well off and could have married anyone, but chooses a widow with two daughters, thinking this woman could be an excellent mother to his sweet child as well. We know how this goes. He does not perceive how ruthless and vile the new family is behind their polite masks, though, and poor Vasilisa is tortured similarly to how she is in the later tales of Cinderella. While she does not visit her mother's grave three times a day to have a good cry like she does in Grimm's, Vasilisa does remember to always feed the doll out of her own meager rations. We don't have a fairy godmother or animal friends in this tale, but the doll almost comes alive after eating, providing Vasilisa with much needed company, comfort, and assistance with the ludicrous task the step mother has set out of jealousy. For you see, Vasilisa got more beautiful and hearty in hail over the years with the more work she was forced to do, while her stepsisters wasted away to mean nothingness. I mean, exercise will get you healthy, so their plan of having her do all the chores kind of backfired. Eventually, the Dower Trio decides they must get rid of Vasilisa. Some tales are more elaborate in how they achieve this, and I'll include those juicy details here. 
One day, when the father goes on a business trip, the stepmother sells the house in town and buys an old one near the outskirts by the dangerous forest, hoping Vasilisa will one day accidentally wander too near to danger in Baba Yaga and get killed. This forest hut is definitely a downgrade from the palatial home in Disney, just saying. But who does that level of overkill? One day just sells their house on the off chance that the new one is close enough to the dangerous wood and the girl will die in the forest? The probability and return on investment on that seems really low. The stepmother sets all sorts of tasks for Vasilisa to do in the forest and is enraged every time the girl comes home in one piece. She does not know about Vasilisa's secret weapon, the doll, that guides her and alerts her to dangers. Finally, sick of beating around the bush and relying on chance to kill her stepdaughter, the evil trio conspires a way to force Vasilisa into Baba Yaga's domain and, they think, certain death. They extinguish every fire in the house. Only Vasilisa can go retrieve some from the forest, which they say, for the mother is sleeping and both sisters' needlework involves silver needles that catch the moonlight just enough for them to be able to see. As a knitter, what? That hardly makes sense. In other tales, the mother can't go because she's old and the daughters are too afraid, so it's down to Vasilisa to get coal from Baba Yaga. So off over obliging Vasilisa goes into the dead of night, armed only with her doll, into Baba Yaga's domain. She continually feeds the doll, who indicates to her which way she should go. On her way, Vasilisa comes across a white knight atop a bright white horse, and soon after, it's day. A bit further on, a red knight on a red stallion passes her by, and shortly thereafter, the sun begins to rise. And after a short time, or a very long time, time is rather suspended here, she sees a black knight on a coal horse who disappeared just beyond a fence in a forest clearing, bringing night with them. Once darkness has descended, the skull fence alights with flames and Baba Yaga's chicken-footed abode is revealed. The forest trembles and the ground groans just as the witch appears, flying in style in her flying mortar and pestle, and landing right down between Vasilisa and the gate. Sweet red, Yaga. Why are you here? asks Baba Yaga menacingly. Trembling, Vasilisa replies, Grandmother, I come for fire. My house is cold, my people will die, I need fire. Baba Yaga snaps and said it's Vasilisa's fault for letting the fires die so her people deserve the same fate and why should she bother helping anyway? Because I ask, is Vasilisa's brave reply. Baba's like, yep, that checks out, any other answer and I would have eaten you so come on in. But of course, nothing comes free from Baba Yaga. Vasilisa serves and watches as the wood witch eats a feast enough for ten men, bones and all, leaving Vasilisa only a thimble's worth of soup and the bread crust, which Vasilisa saves to feed to the doll later in the evening. Sated, Baba Yaga sets Vasilisa the tasks of washing her clothes, sweeping the yard, cleaning the house, preparing the next meal. Cinderella, Cinderella, Cinderella! Oh, and the near impossible task of separating the piles of mildewed corn from the good corn. Sound familiar? By the time she returns. Note in some tellings it's taking a measure of wheat and picking out all of the black grain and wild peas. Anyway, if any one of these things is not done to Baba Yaga's satisfaction, Vasilisa will be cooked for dinner instead. Vasilisa knows these tasks are impossible and resigns herself to being eaten. The doll, however, will have no such thing. After Vasilisa feeds it the soup and bread, it comes alive, comforts her, telling her all will be well and to get some sleep, for the morning is wiser than the evening. When Vasilisa awakes, all of the tasks save the cooking the dinner have been magically completed to perfection, so much so that Baba Yaga cannot find a single grain out of place. Vasilisa serves the feast as Baba Yaga claps her hands and calls out, Ho, oh, my faithful servants, friends of my heart, haste and grind my wheat or corn. And immediately three creepy pairs of disembodied hands appear and begin to process the grain. Wisely, Vasilisa does not inquire about them. After she has finished her meal, again fit for an army, Baba Yaga sets Vasilisa the tasks of cooking and cleaning as well as points to a pile of dirt and says, in that pile of dirt are many poppy seeds, millions of poppy seeds. Apparently someone wanted to show their malice to Yaga and mix the two. I want, when I return, to have one pile of poppy seeds and one pile of dirt. Vasilisa almost faints with anxiety. This seems even more difficult than the previous task. Again, she feeds the doll, asks for advice and aid, and the doll takes care of this most arduous task in addition to the other ones while the girl is asleep. Baba Yaga returns home just after the black rider and coal horse cross the gate, and again she can find nothing out of place with Vasilisa's work. She calls her invisible creepy hand servants to press the oil out of the poppy seeds and sets to work eating her four-hour meal. 
This time, however, Vasilisa has questions. She asks about each of the riders she saw along her way through the forest. Baba Yaga says those are her servants, day, rising sun, and night, and none of them can harm Vasilisa. Baba Yaga needles Vasilisa saying, go ahead, ask me about my creepy disembodied hand servants. And just as Vasilisa's about to, the doll jumps up and down in the girl's apron, jostling her back to her senses. She declines the question, much to Yaga's consternation, saying, too much knowledge can make a person old. Too right, says Yaga. If you had asked about them, they would have seized you like the grain and prepared you as my next meal. But tell me, how did you get to be so wise beyond your years? True to her promise to her dying mother, Vasilisa does not mention the doll and instead says it's her dead mother's blessing. Now, there are to be no naive blessings in this chicken-footed house, so Baba Yaga flips out, kicks her out, and sends her off into the dead of night with a flaming skull on a pike with which to light and warm her cold home. Vasilisa is about to thank Baba Yaga, but by this point the doll is freaking out, basically saying, move it sister, don't you dare get trapped here, you've been too nice for too long and the time for manners has passed. Through the wood, back home the duo go, Vasilisa getting creeped out by the flaming skull, but it tells her, Do not throw me away, beautiful Vasilisa. Bring me to thy stepmother. So she does what the creepy skull says and keeps on going. Eventually, her stepfamily is overjoyed to see her, even though they were also overjoyed at the prospect of her death, because they've been unable to keep a fire going in the house since she left. All seems well, but the flaming skull, never blinking, burns into the wicked stepmother and stepsisters throughout the night. And by morning, they are not but blackened cinders. How's that for Cinderella? Happily ever after. The tale could end happily for some, albeit abruptly, here. Or it can keep on going. And it looks like we have the time. The next morning, Vasilisa buries the flaming skull in the earth and locks up the house. I'm assuming she just leaves the bodies. Like, no big deal. Her stepfamily dead, she goes into town to live with an old childless woman. She gets bored waiting for her father to return and asks the woman to buy her some flax to spin. Spin she does, and the finest thread ever seen, too. It is so fine that no loom existed with which to weave it. That is, until Vasilisa takes the doll out of the closet, feeds it, and asks for its help to build a frame. To complete this request, it requires an old frame, old basket, and horse's hair. The rest is magically taken care of. Vasilisa spends one month, two months, all winter weaving her fine, fine thread into the most elegant fabric, which was itself fine enough to pass through the eye of a needle. She gifts this fine fabric to the old woman as payment for living in her home, thinking she will sell it at market. But the old woman knows how rare and special this linen is, so goes to court to present it to the Tsar himself instead. He also recognizes its craftsmanship and offers any sum for it, but the old woman, knowing how priceless it is, offers it as a gift. Seamstresses from all over are called to make the fine fabric into fine shirts for the Tsar, but none of them are deft and skillful enough to work with such fine, rare material. The old woman then offers the services of Vasilisa, her adopted daughter, to make the Tsar's shirts, as she's the one who spun and wove the linen in the first place. Vasilisa, knowing that this task is of the utmost importance and honor, knows that she must complete it by herself, and shuts herself away to sew the royal shirts, and does not seek the assistance of her doll. Once the king tries on the amazing shirts, he demands to meet the talented seamstress. Upon seeing Vasilis the beautiful, the wise, the brave, he falls so in love with her that they are soon married. Vasilis's father finally returns from the far-off kingdom, and he, the old lady, and the doll live with Vasilisa in the palace happily forever after. So that's Vasilisa the Brave, or Wise or Beautiful. It's a bit more of a hardcore mix of the Wicked Stepmother and Sisters, the Fairy Godmother. Well, of sorts, Baba Yaga is not one to be crossed, trifled with, or taken lightly. Companions, the tall, like the animals from our later versions. Absent fathers, cinders, although here they're more the sinister and burnt the selfish family to a crisp type of cinders. Impossible tasks, comeuppance and reckonings, and a happily ever after marriage to the ruler. It remains one of my favorite fairy tales to date, and I do hope you enjoyed the telling of it. And with that, our walk into Baba Yaga's woods is at a close. Er, for now. But what are some different versions of the tale that you know? The absolute best thing about fairy tales is how they change depending on when and where they are, so let me know in the comments below. Thank you, friends and fiends, as always, for joining me here on this fiery fairy tale. If you like what I do here, please like and subscribe and click that notification bell. I'll see you soon in the next video. Goodbye!